Good morning, church. I am grateful for you being here today. And I hope that something I say this morning, something that I share with you from God's Word will touch you, will help you to be a better Christian. I don't really have to stand here and tell you this morning that it seems that the time is coming that we are going to be persecuted. It, it's not something that's joyful to think about, but when you stop and consider the things that are happening in our country, I really feel like there's a time coming when Christians are going to begin suffering persecution. And as we consider that fact, we might be tempted to think to ourselves that that's unfair. After all, we are supposed to live in the most tolerant society that the world has ever known, and yet the one thing that seems to, that it cannot be tolerated is Christianity. And it is unfair. And it goes against everything that the proponents of tolerance stand for. And so we look at that, th these facts and, and we think to ourselves, why? Yeah, you know, we, we, we feel as if, as if it, it, it's strange. Why is it that this is the one thing that the world can't tolerate? But folks, I want you to know today that it's not strange. It's something that has always happened to God's people. And I suppose if for no other reason, the reason behind it is because what God's people stand for, what Christianity stands for, goes completely against everything the world is and does. And that's one thing the world will not tolerate. Your Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yet all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul didn't say that if, if, you're, if you're trying to live godly, if you want to live godly, you might suffer persecution. Or that the chances are that you will suffer persecution. He's, no, he says, if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Though I don't know that I would go so far as to make this statement, but I'm going to state it for your consideration today. As one man has put it, if you haven't suffered persecution because of your faith, there's something wrong with your brand of Christianity. The Bible spends a great deal of time speaking about persecution. Jesus himself didn't uh, have a blind eye towards the reality of he and his followers being persecuted because he said to his disciples in John chapter 15 verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And then in 1 John 3 and verse 13, John here seems to be the one keying in on this idea. John, 1 John 3 and verse 13, John says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 22, Paul there says that it is through many tribulations that we must enter into the kingdom of God. So no, folks, it, it's really not a, a strange thing. It's not a foreign concept that we are a suffering people because we're God's people. It's always been that way. And who could forget Revelation 2 and verse 10 as, as the first century Christians were, were suffering such brutal and severe persecution and, and Jesus says to them through the pen of John, He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison and, and there you'll suffer tribulation ten days, but don't fear any of those things that you're about to suffer. And Christ was always up front with His disciples. 
He never painted a rosy picture of what Christianity was all about. He, he never pointed out all of the positives to the exclusions of the negatives. Folks, part of being a Christian is suffering and suffering persecution. Now that leads us to our text this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter was no stranger to persecution. I recall one instance in Acts the third chapter as he and his partner John had approached the temple gate and they see a lame man sitting there begging for alms. And Peter looked at him square in the face and he says, Silver and gold I don't have any, but what I do have I'll give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Arise and walk. And that man who had been carried to that same place for years stood up on his feet. Not only did he walk, but as he begins to enter into that temple with Peter and John, the Bible says that he was leaping and praising the name of God. And the Jewish leaders got pretty upset over that. And they beat Peter and John and throw them into prison. But they realize that because they have such a following with the people that they're not going to be able to keep them there forever. And so they decide what they're going to do is is just beat them some more and let them go and threaten them. says, don't you ever preach in that name again. But you know what? The persecution they suffered didn't dampen their faith. It it didn't weaken their resolve. It, It didn't sever their ties with Christ. It made it even stronger because no sooner than they had walked out of the prison, there they are preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus again. And they're going to continue suffering persecution because of their faith. And I can't help but think that as Peter writes to these Christians, in in the book of 1 Peter especially, that he was mindful of the persecution that he himself had suffered. Now if you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter there mentions various trials that those Christians were going through. That's 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't really know exactly what it was, at least from a historical perspective. I I don't know what it was, but they were suffering persecution. They They were having some kind of fiery trial they were going through. And then if you look at the third chapter in verse number 14 of the same book, Peter there says, But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. That's the idea, persecution, suffering for the righteousness sake, suffering because of your faith. So I want to talk to you this morning about a song that we sing sometimes, an old song. It's called Victory in Jesus. But I especially want to key in on the idea of persecution this morning because even in our times of persecution and suffering, the Bible still teaches us that we have victory in Jesus, even in persecution. I'm going to assume this morning, by virtue of your presence here, that you agree the Bible teaches that. I'm not going to establish the fact this morning through the scriptures that that we have victory in Jesus. I'll mention some verses later on, but, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that today. I'm making the assumption you agree with me about that. What I want to do this morning is share with you some ways from, from 1 Peter chapter 4 that we can enjoy that victory in Jesus. If Jesus does give us the victory, how do we get it? And I believe Peter shares some key answers to that question. In the first place this morning, I believe Peter is telling these Christians to expect persecution. Don't find yourself feeling as if it's a strange thing that you're suffering persecution. No, just expect it. It's going to happen. Look at verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 4. 
He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Don't, 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 don't wonder why this has happened. Don't think that it's strange. Don't, don't be upset. Oh, it, it's going to happen. It's not a strange thing. And yet sometimes when we begin to be persecuted today, we think that it's so strange. We don't know why people are persecuting us. But Peter says, no, it's not strange. And as a matter of fact, he wanted to emphasize the point so much that he would say in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 9, to resist the devil. Remember, remember in verse 8 of 1 Peter 5, he says, Your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? And in verse 9 he says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. It's not a strange thing. All Christians across the globe are going to suffer or are suffering for their faith. They're being persecuted. It's not a strange thing. Expect it to happen. And one day, I truly believe that it'll happen even here in America. I think to myself, though enduring persecution is not fun, that if our Lord and Savior could suffer in the world and overcome, then why should I expect it to be any different than me, in me? I already read for you John chapter 15 where, where Jesus says, just know this, that if the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. And in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer points to Jesus. Verse 11, or chapter 11, excuse me, we, we have that chapter where, where the writer mentions all of these faithful servants of God. And then we immediately come to chapter 12 and the Bible says, Therefore, since we are encompassed by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every Wait, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You see, folks, we can expect persecution all day long. But when it comes, when it happens, it's hard to deal with sometimes. And I want you to know today that as part of your expecting persecution, you ought to have Jesus before your very eyes. And that if you don't, you will become weary, you will become discouraged, and might even abandon your faith. Jesus wasn't too good to suffer persecution Neither am I. Now, God allows His children to be subjected to persecution and suffering so as to test their faith. We read that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. About how gold is tried or tested by fire and that their faith was being tested through these fiery trials. And it strengthens us and, and burns out all the impurities. And in turn, we receive patience according to James 1. And verse number 2. And even though it might not seem pleasant at the time we endure persecution, there is a great reward for it. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, the Bible says, But may the God of all grace who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Peter says, yeah, you're going to suffer persecution, but there's a great reward. God is going to make you perfect and mature. It's going to establish you and strengthen you and settle you. A great reward. And so, if you want to have victory in Jesus over your persecutions, you've got to expect it, number one. Number two this morning, look at verses 13 and 14, where Peter essentially says, rejoice in your persecutions. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part He's blasphemed, but on your part He's glorified. See, the world wants us to think that persecution serves no real purpose, that persecution uh, is, is something to be abhorred. 
And though we don't have to enjoy persecution, the Bible calls us to rejoice in it. The question, though, is why? Why does God want you to rejoice when you're being persecuted? Well, I'll just answer the way that Jesus would answer. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you and they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you're being persecuted because of your faith in Christ and because of your righteousness, God is saying to you, you have a great reward. That's what they did to the prophets of old. Even to the point of killing them. And their reward was great. And your reward will be great if you endure this persecution. In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, we have some worldly benefits to persecution. Where Paul says, not only that, but glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. See, those are some physical aspects of the, 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 the reason we should rejoice in persecution because we receive endurance, we receive character, and we receive hope. James also points out some of the benefits. James 1, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so as Peter mentions here, rejoicing in Christ, he also shares with us reasons to rejoice. Number one, because of the glory that we have in the future. That's in verse number 13. That when His glory, that when Jesus' glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. In the second, first part of verse number 14, Peter says we have a blessing in the present. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, you're blessed, you're happy. And then in the last part of verse 14, because Christ is glorified. Number one, we need to expect persecution, but secondly, we need to rejoice in it. In the third place this morning, Peter says to these Christians, don't be ashamed. Don't ever be ashamed because you're suffering for righteousness' sake. Verses 15 and 16 of our text, the Bible says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. You see, folks, when a murderer or a thief or an adulterer, or when a wicked person suffers, it's a shameful thing. Have you ever wondered why they print pictures of criminals in newspapers and such? Why do they plaster their face all over the news, the television? Because it's a shameful thing. Sometimes it's, it's to help identify the people and to find them so people know what to look for. But, but sometimes I believe it's for no other reason than to shame them. You know what, if, if I were to commit an atrocious act like murder, you're going to be ashamed of me when you read of that and see my picture in the newspaper, aren't you? My parents would be ashamed of me. And any kind of suffering or, or any kind of persecution that I would receive, it would be a shameful thing. But Peter says, not so if you suffer for righteousness' sake. For a Christian to suffer because of his faith, that's not a shameful thing. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, uh, 2 and verse 20, he says, What credit is it if you, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, it's commendable before God. That's kind of like the thief on the cross when he speaks to that other thief and he says, Why are you blaspheming Christ? We're here because of, of, of our wrongdoings, but this man's done nothing wrong. See, they were suffering because of their wrongdoings, and that was a shameful thing for them. But for Christ to hang on that cross, 
when he had done nothing wrong, committed no sin, being persecuted because of who he was. It wasn't a shameful thing. It was a glorious thing. Sure, there was shame involved in it and the fact that they stripped him and, and beat him and he was bloody and, and, and they mocked him as a, as a false king, or so they thought. But it was a, a glorious thing and, and God commended His Son for enduring that kind of persecution and suffering. Think about the glory of Stephen suffering patiently and being murdered for preaching the gospel to such a stiff-necked and wicked generation. So much so that when Stephen draws his dying breath, do you remember what he says to those people, to God, about those people rather? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen suffering persecution, and yet he was able to endure it patiently to the commendation of his life. Now I remembered Peter, and we've studied this most recently in, in our study of Matthew. Peter was once ashamed to suffer for the Lord. Mark 14 verse 68 says so much. Why else would he deny the Christ? He goes into that courtyard where he's following Jesus from afar off, a, a long distance away. And some people spot him and say, don't you know this man? He says, no, I've never, never seen him before in my life. Another young lady comes up and says, I saw you with him. He says, no, you're mistaken. It must have been somebody else. I don't, I don't know that man. What are you talking about? And a third time, somebody comes up to him and says, your speech betrays you. You're a Galilean. You must know him. He says, no, cursing and swearing. I don't know the man. He was ashamed to suffer for his faith and friendship to Jesus. Peter says, don't, don't act like me. Because Jesus says in Mark 8, 38, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Suffering for your faith is not a shameful thing. Don't be ashamed of it. Number four this morning, if you want to have the victory in Jesus over your persecutions, you need to understand the reason behind it. There is a reason. Maybe lots of reasons. And Peter gives one example of the reason here in verses 17 and 18. He says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will the end be of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I don't have a lot of time to develop this, and there's a lot of different thoughts about it. But I really think, in light of the context of Peter's discussion here, what he is saying to these Christians is, there's a reason behind your persecution. James talked about that. We've already pointed out that sometimes God lets us suffer to strengthen our faith. But here Peter gives another reason for it. The suffering, folks, that God's people receive from the hand of wicked and sinful men is apparently one way that God begins judging His people, His own children. He allows these things to happen in order to continue purifying His children, to burn out all the dross and the impurities that He may possess. And as both Jeremiah and Isaiah begin, and they talk about the potter and the clay and, and how God is the potter molding us as the clay into what He wants us to be. Folks, one way He does that is by letting us suffer persecution. To burn out the impurities, to burn out all the dross and the things that don't belong there. It's because suffering persecution has a way of doing that to us. And so don't fall into the trap that Job fell into of thinking that, that God is punishing you because of some great sin. He's trying to make you stronger. And in 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 4 and 5, Paul there indicates that for this to happen is clear evidence of the righteousness of God. I don't know everything about the way God works, but I know that according to Peter, one way that God begins judgment on the house of God is to allow persecution, suffering. It's not pleasant, not fun, 
but we can rejoice in it, understanding the benefit behind it. Let's look at one more idea this morning, and that comes from verse number 19. Not only must we expect persecution and rejoice in persecution, don't be ashamed of it and understand the reason behind it. Perhaps the most important thing Peter says here regarding our persecution and the victory in Jesus is found in verse number 19, where he says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. If you want to have victory in Jesus over your persecutions, you've got to commit your soul to God. The question though is, how can I do this and why should I do it? Well, how do you do it? By doing good. That's what Peter says. Commit your soul to God in doing good. It doesn't matter what anybody does to you. It doesn't matter what kind of persecution you're subjected to. You can still do good. You can find something good to do even in the midst of your persecutions. And that's, I suppose, why Jesus said in Luke 6, 27 and 28, I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. After all, there's nothing more they can do to you. They want to persecute you and they want to kill you like they killed Stephen for preaching the gospel. Let them do it. Sure, it's going to be a sad thing for those who know you and, and your family, but guess what? You'll be better off. Nothing more they can do to you. Jesus said, fear him who's able to destroy both body and soul in hell, not him who can only destroy the body, Matthew 10, 28. And I'm telling you this morning that if Jesus can suffer persecution for nothing done wrong, that if Stephen can do the same thing, and that these two men can still do good in the midst of that persecution, that we can do the same. Now, before I, I get into the closing and invitation, I want to draw attention to something that maybe you've never thought of before. And I think this is the crux of what Peter's trying to say. If you write in your Bible, you might want to emphasize the phrase, faithful creator. It's very important to what Peter has to say here. We've answered the question, how do I commit my soul to God in doing good? But why should I commit my soul to God? And the answer is because He's a faithful Creator. Because, folks, God is the Creator. Because He is the Creator, He has the power to do what is right in the end. That means that when I suffer persecution, that when I endure that persecution faithfully, and let's just say they kill me, that when that happens, He has the power to save me. The power to do what is right. But Peter didn't call God a creator. He called Him a faithful creator. And so because He is faithful... I can trust Him to do what is right in the end. See, it wouldn't do any good for me to know that God had the power to do what is right in the end if I couldn't trust Him to do it. Nor would it do me any good to trust that He could do it if He didn't have the power. But because He's a faithful Creator, I know that there's a great reward waiting for me if I patiently endure persecutions. Thanks be to God who always gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1, Peter, or 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Romans 8 and verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 1 John 3, verse, uh, 5, verses 4 and 5, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Folks, persecution is not fun. Christians have always suffered for their faith. Because the Christian faith disagrees with the world. And in the midst of suffering, it's easy to throw in the towel and submit to whatever evil force is responsible. But remember the encouraging words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7-18. through 18. I won't take time to read all of it there, but, but, but the idea is we're suffering, but we're okay. Okay. 
They've beat us, they've persecuted us, they've spoken against us, but everything's fine. We're okay, God's got this, He's he's in control, He's going to take care of us. So much so that when you get to verse number 18, Paul says, for our light affliction. I want you to notice that, the beating, the killing, the persecution they suffered. He says, it's a light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's only temporary, it's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I know that because you're here today, you want to have the victory in Jesus. Even in your persecution. And maybe you can't this morning because you're not being faithful to God. Maybe you're not committing your soul to God. If if you're a child of God this morning and, and you find that you're not committing your soul to Him, why not do that today? Come to Him, make a commitment and a resolve to do good everywhere you go, even in the midst of persecution. And trust Him as a faithful Creator. Repent of any sins you have, rededicate your life, whatever it needs to be. Maybe this morning you can't have victory in Jesus because you're not a child of God. And when you suffer persecution and you're not a child of God, uh, there's no way you can glory in that. It That would be a shameful thing. So if you need to obey the gospel this morning to become a child of God, we invite you to do that. I read a portion of Revelation 2 earlier this morning where Jesus through the pen of John says, Do not fear those things which you're about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison and there you'll suffer tribulation for ten days. That's not the end of the verse. Jesus continues and He says, But be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. And through what they were suffering, it was not an easy challenge to be faithful unto death. So the question I want you to ponder as we sing the invitation song this morning is, Are you faithful? If you were to meet God today, Would God look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant? If you can't answer that, yes, you can't have the victory in Jesus. So if we can help you experience the victory in Jesus today, please come, let us pray with you, study with you, whatever we need to do, as together we stand and sing. On behalf of the Longville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865 717 0444. Or for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you and we hope you have a blessed day.